with LinkedIn, we're going to talk about LinkedIn, how to generate more business, how to generate more leads from LinkedIn. Uh, with myself, uh, I'm, I have my notepad here, I have my pen because I'm here to learn. I use LinkedIn, probably not using it properly, <laughs> and, and I'm here to learn on, on how to do some of these things and, and how LinkedIn is different from Facebook or Twitter. Uh, of course, now today we have uh, the Canada is known as the Canada's number one. LinkedIn expert uh, Melanie on the line with us. Now, in case you don't know about Melanie, Melanie is actually the international best-selling author uh, of the book, The LinkedIn Code. If you have not read that book, I highly encourage you to, re to read it. Uh, I have it on my Kindle. In fact, I read the book just a few weeks ago. So, uh, Melanie, are you there? I sure am, Dan. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. Now, I know Melanie, you just, I know you just recently got married, so congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we're just getting back into the swing of things. So thank you for taking the time and doing this uh, training with us. So so oh, thank you. Appreciate that. It's my pleasure. Uh, Vancouver is one of my favorite cities. So uh, you know, I'm a, I'm originally an Ontario girl. Please don't hold that against me. I've lived in BC now for ten and a half years. And yes. A funny quick story is the first five years that I lived in BC, people used to you know I'd meet new people and they'd say, "So Melanie, where are you from?" And I'm like. Uh, I'm from Ontario, and then <laughs> after year five, when people would say to me, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from here. So something triggered in my brain after five years where I realized that I'm no longer an Ontario girl, I'm a BC girl now. <laughs> That's right. You're, you're one of us now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm thrilled and honored to, uh, to do this for your network, Dan, and I, I had the pleasure of... Uh, attending one of your events. Uh, I can't even remember what month it was now. It was the month I was speaking in Vancouver. I think it was November or October. I yes, November. That's correct, November. Yeah. Gosh, I traveled too much to be able to remember uh, months and dates. Um, but it was wonderful, and I got such an amazing, warm welcome for your, from your group. So when you asked me to do this, it was totally my pleasure to do it. So uh, without further ado, I'm just, I don't want to ramble here. I want to teach you guys some stuff. So I hope that's okay. Let's just dive right in. And uh, today we're just going to really talk about some things that are really important um, using LinkedIn. And you know, my my favorite social network has always been LinkedIn, and I'll share with you a few reasons why. So let's get started here, and let's make sure my slides are working. There we go. Okay. So I there's a question box where you can ask questions, and uh, you can also just pop in comments. I'm not going to take questions during the time that I'm, I'm going to go through uh, the presentation, but at the end of it, I'm going to definitely answer any questions that come up. So the first question I have for you, and go ahead and type in the question box, how many of you feel like this when you think about social media? <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm typing the box right now. <laughs> exactly what and I, I can probably add a few more on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is exactly what I felt like um, back in 2007 when I started using social media. And in just a real quick, short, funny story is I, my family was out east in Ontario, and they kept bugging me. They kept like saying to me, Melanie, you know, get on Facebook. And I'm like, what is this stupid Facebook? I had no idea what it was and no desire to be anywhere online. I was like, I was just like Miss Privacy. I didn't like anybody writing about me in the media. I didn't like anything. I just wanted to have like my private life. And it's so funny when people hear that story and see, you know, what I kind of do now. Um, but the, it was interesting because as they were asking me to do this, I was finally like, okay, fine, I'll join. And I would only be friends with my immediate family and my closest friends. And I'd say no uh, to every other friend request I got. And I had just written a book at the time. It wasn't the LinkedIn code, my current book. It was a book long before in, in a, my previous life. And I, I had sold a business just before that. And I didn't know how to market a book because my previous businesses, I owned a few, a few franchises. And I used to literally spend like $800,000 a year on marketing my businesses, TV commercials, radio, newspaper, billboards, sides of buses, backs of buses, direct mail, you name it. Mm. And when I was like, Gosh, I don't know how to sell a $20 book. Like, there, you know, how much of a marketing budget can you put behind a $20 book? With, with, with the $1 royalty, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
exactly. And it was through a traditional publisher. That's exactly what it was. So I was like, I just don't even know. And as I started using uh, Facebook to stay in touch with my family, I was like, you know, I think there's a business application here and I'm going to figure it out. Nobody at the time knew what that was. Everybody was kind of struggling and, you know, they were playing with Facebook, but they didn't know what to do. And so as I started learning, I literally became a full-time student for three years, studying everything I could about online marketing and social media. And I started getting good at it at the end of the three years. <laughs> that took me a while. I was a slow learner. Wow. Um, but as I did, I started having business owners approaching me and asking me for help. And it was then that I was like, absolutely. And I realized how much I really helped other business, uh, how much I really enjoyed helping other businesses, you know, have more success. And at that time, I also realized that, you know, of all the different social networks that are out there, there are some that are better than others for certain reasons and purposes. Like, for example, Facebook is a wonderful social network to stay in touch with your family and friends. And I just adore, you know, looking at pictures of my nephews all the time and, you know, seeing what my son's up to because he moved away to Toronto a few years ago. And so it's great for that. But I, I was really struggling to see some of the business side of it. And so that's where, you know, LinkedIn kind of came into play for me. But through all the research that I did over these three years, and, and I continue to do, I've been doing for eight years now, but like literally, you know, full time for three years, I realized that there was actually only two types of social media, despite the fact that we have all these different social media platforms out there. The first type is the one that makes friends. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with making friends. I have made so many amazing friends through social media and business, you know, contacts and colleagues and all kinds of different things. But there's another type of social media that makes money. <clears throat> and this is where LinkedIn came to pl into play. And I don't mean when I say make money, I don't mean spamming, pitching, promotion, all that kind of stuff that you see businesses do that doesn't go over very well on a regular basis. I mean, you know, using it strategically. And that's where LinkedIn really kind of resonated with me. And there's a number of reasons why. LinkedIn's got some interesting, you know, stats that make it a unique social network in relation to the others. First of all, it's the number one business social network. There really isn't anything that competes with LinkedIn. You know, there's lots of things that compete with, you know, all the other social networks that are out there. Some people like Facebook, some like Twitter, some like, you know, playing on Pinterest and some like Instagram and, you know, everybody kind of has their thing. But when it comes to business social networks, this is really truly the only one, like the main one. A few stats that make it uh, an interesting network is that two new people join LinkedIn every second. So it's got a tremendous amount of momentum. The last stats I heard, and these are going back uh, about six months now, so uh, these numbers might not be completely accurate at the moment because it takes a while to kind of get this information, but the last time I heard numbers, there was 9 million people in Canada using LinkedIn. <clears throat> and our last census uh, results came out to being 33 million Canadians. So if you take out you know, the seniors, you take out the kids, <clears throat> you take out the stay-at-home moms, you take out even some of the college kids. I spoke at UBC the other day, University of British Columbia, and it was amazing. You know, some of them have profiles, some of them didn't. They haven't quite figured out where, where why they need them yet because they're not in the job market yet, and and they very much think that that's what it's for. It's about you know finding a job, which really is you know can be true if that's what you're looking for. But the, where the vast majority of what happens on LinkedIn is very business oriented. So with, with 9 million people in Canada uh, using LinkedIn and a 33 million population, you take out all the people that I just mentioned, the seniors, the kids, the students, the stay-at-home moms, and even some of the you know, skilled laborers that just haven't found a need for LinkedIn, it's the vast majority of the rest of the population. The average household income on LinkedIn is 109,000, so it's substantially higher than Facebook or Twitter. So if you're going after a more affluent uh, you know, demographic, LinkedIn's perfect for you. This is interesting. People are two times more confident in the information that they find on LinkedIn. And I, I truly believe that this is because people aren't sharing, you know, pictures of what they had for lunch and they're not sharing cat memes on LinkedIn. So people trust the information a lot more so. Hmm. And then this is the best one of all. It's 277% it's more effective for lead generation. And the thing that I find interesting about this stat is Almost everybody that I see using LinkedIn is using it incorrectly. 
So when I teach courses or seminars or stuff like that, I'm like, I always say my goal is to make you 2000 777% more effective for lead generation because if people are doing that not knowing what they're doing imagine what you could do when you know what you're doing awesome makes <laughs> sense so the other thing that's really important to realize is that LinkedIn is a very important part of your personal brand when people are thinking do, about doing business with you whether your business is you as an individual or you are you know uh, you know a person within a company People want to know who they're doing business with. And what do we do today, Dan? What do we do? We Google people's names, right? That's correct. I find out about somebody who, I remember when I met you, I'm like, who is this Dan Lock guy? Let me Google him. Let's check, let's check him out. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing about that is when you Google somebody, often their LinkedIn profile shows up at the top. It either shows up in the first spot, the second spot, or the third spot. It doesn't even matter which of those three it shows up in. Mm. What happens is it's the place that people know where they can find out information about you. So they click on it and it's often your very first online impression. So you have to ask yourself, you have to look at your profile right now and say, am I making the kind of impression that I actually want to make? And if not, then you know, you have a little bit of work to do and I'm going to show you exactly what you should do tonight. So here is a big mistake uh, that, uh, that people make with LinkedIn. They treat it like a resume site. They think that this is a place where you post your professional resume or your bio, or some people even think, I, you know, I don't need LinkedIn, I'm not searching for a job. Well, LinkedIn, when they first started out, was very heavy on the whole job seeker and recruiter around of it, and it was very much like that. So it's kind of been labeled like that for a while, but they've made some huge uh, transformations over the last number of years and they've really changed you know who they are and how they're seen in the marketplace and they're very much you know uh, the business social network it's not about finding a job there's only 16 percent of the people using LinkedIn that are using it for recruiting or job seeking the rest of them the other 84 percent are using it for business so you can see that the vast majority of people are actually using this as a, as a potential business tool, business building tool, networking tool. And if you post your resume on LinkedIn, it's not going to resonate with that audience that you want to connect with. Unless you're looking for a job, you know, that's a fine approach. But if you're not looking for a job, if you're looking at using this as a business building tool, you need to take a different approach. And so what I've done is I've created a three step formula to really lay the foundation for your success on LinkedIn, to make sure that you're showing up, that your personal brand looks great, uh, and that your profile really speaks to who you want it to. The first step of that is to get found. Now, just like with Google, when people do Google searches on a daily basis and are looking for you know, a specific thing, information, a service provider, a product, whatever, if you're not showing up on page one, you're kind of invisible. There was a, a great quote uh, that came out of a conference that I spoke at last year. and We followed all these quotes and we ended up creating a blog post on the 87 best quotes that came out of this conference. Mm, nice. And, yeah, it was cool. And one of them was, where's the best place to hide a dead body? <laughs> Page two of Google. <laughs> that is the answer. Page two of Google, which basically means if you're not showing up on page one, you're invisible. Mm. Very much the same thing with LinkedIn. So you want to be found when people are looking for what you offer. The next step is to attract your ideal client. If you've got a resume based LinkedIn profile and it speaks just about you, it's not going to attract your ideal client. If you're looking for a job, it might attract your ideal employer. However, I would even suggest a, you know, a, a bit of a, change to that and really kind of speak to your ideal employer if you're looking for a job. And the last step is to stand out. We know that social media is noisy. There's well over, uh, you know, well over a billion people using social media. There's 300 and I think 75 million people using LinkedIn right now, one point something billion people using Facebook. We need to stand out. And this might sound really challenging given that there's so many people using these platforms, but the reality of it is, is that 99% of them are using it very poorly. 99% have a really crappy profile. 
So to stand out is actually exceptionally easy. This is the easiest of the three. And I'll share with you a little bit more about each of these steps to give you some, some specific tactics that you can take away today and implement. So as I mentioned, the first step is to get found. Each day people are doing searches for specific keywords. They might be looking for uh, you know, an accountant or a lawyer or a financial advisor. Most people aren't looking for a financial advisor, by the way, because that's very much a business based on trust. And they're usually looking for referrals uh, for something like that from people that they know. But you know, on the rare occasion that might happen. And you might be in a business where not a lot of people are searching for you, and that's okay because really the real results of, of uh, what you do on LinkedIn is gonna come from your proactive use of it. However, isn't it beautiful to just to get leads that find you? And so this is the part about getting found that's important. So you wanna be showing up at the top of the search results. So you need to think about, you know, what are the specific keywords that people are using so that you can show up when they're looking for it? And the closer you show up to the top of the, the search results, the better it is, just like on Google. So there's a number of ways to do that. The, you know, the, the way that you're going to do that is to choose, you know, two or three specific keywords. And if you're, if you're doing business in a specific geography, like let's say for example, your business is limited to Vancouver, you might want to use the word Vancouver. So this example of Kelowna accountant, this is one of my clients. And, uh, you know, we throw in the word Kelowna accountant, just in case somebody's doing a search for Kelowna accountant, not just accountant. So another little handy tip. Only do this if you're doing business locally. Uh, I have a global business. I have clients, you know, in Australia, in the UK, and in, in different parts of Europe, and all across the U.S. and Canada. So this doesn't apply for me. But if it does apply for you, consider adding that. So the key to picking the right keywords <clears throat> is thinking about the keywords that people would use when they're looking for what you offer. And I want to really encourage you not to get creative here. Understand the keywords that people would use when they're looking for you. So I'm going to give an example of a website developer or designer. If somebody is looking for uh, somebody to build them a website, and you've got a website person that you know, you know, really kind of specializes in you know maybe branding and some other things, and they might want to call themselves some cool and creative names. You know, maybe uh, branding this or what, marketing that or whatever. At the end of the day, they're going to miss those leads because what somebody's looking for is a website designer, or or depending on the language that they use. And Dan, you, I know you know a lot about websites. You know, not everybody does, right? So you know, when you're looking for somebody to build a website, are you looking for a developer or a designer? A lot of people don't know the difference between the two, so they might use those terms, you know, interchangeably or one or the other. So you want to, you know, if you're a website designer, you're going to probably want to use both of those keyword terms. I'm a website developer and a website designer because some people don't know what they're actually looking for. Hmm. So it's really important to choose two or three primary keywords that really describe who you are, what you do, and then you want to optimize your profile for that. So there's four key places. There's other places that you can put your keywords, but there's four primary key places to put your keywords so that you can actually get found in the search results. And I'm assuming that everybody on the line wants to know what those four places are, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, Dan. Huh? Well, and, that, and that to be continued will be the next webinar, right? No? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just leave that as a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> the first one's the headline. The headline actually holds a tremendous amount of weight in LinkedIn's algorithm. And every time I say that word, I realize that people might think that I'm techie. <laughs> and it's funny, I was, I was meeting with a realtor the other day because I have a property I'm going to sell. And he's like, um, you know, how would you like me to send the agreement? Would you like me to send it via, you know, um, what's Dan, what's that document uh, service that you can use where you can send uh, Dropbox? No, no, document service where you can actually sign it online. You just like type in your name. Doc there's a couple of those. There are a couple of them, not just one. Yeah. There's, anyway, I know, I know which one you're referring to. There's a, there's a big one. It's called Doc something. Anyways, he's like, you know, would you like me to send that? I'm like, you know, just attach it to the email. He's like, well, I really just thought you were like a super techie person. And you might which I know you're not. <laughs> not at all. I'm not at no. all. And, and I think that that's one of the reasons why when I, when I teach about LinkedIn uh, or different social media things that people kind of really get it because I'm not coming from a techie standpoint. The beautiful thing about social media actually is there's really very little that's techie about it. 
Correct. Um, you know, the setup of a profile might be a little bit techy and understanding, you know, a little bit about how to navigate from around it might be techy, but even a non techy person like me can learn that. What it's really about is, you know, relationship building and, and lead generation and, and, you know, all these different things and people just don't understand that. So don't get overwhelmed if you're not a techy person because I'm not either. When I first started LinkedIn, I couldn't even figure out how to add a video to my own profile. I actually had a course. It was called the LinkedIn Profit Formula, which I've discontinued because uh, I've launched a new course. Uh, and it was funny in the in one of the modules that I, I created about you know how to create a great LinkedIn profile. Uh, one of the things I recommend is, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's about you know adding video to your profile. And LinkedIn used to have a very convoluted, complex system where you had to do it through like slide sharing, you had to do this and that, and it was just really convoluted. So I said in my in the video of my course, I'm like, and in the next video. Um, I'm going to show you how to add a, a video to your LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn's changed the way they do it. Now it's like as easy as just entering in the URL, but it used to be complex. And I'm like, and just so you know, I'm not a techie person. I don't even actually know how to do this myself. So one of my team members is actually going to do that video, you know, and now they've changed it so that it's really, really easy. But now get back, getting back to getting found. Uh, the first place where you want to put your keywords is in your headline because, as I was mentioning about LinkedIn's algorithm, uh, it's it's the headline holds a tremendous amount of weight. So you want to have you know one or two keywords in your headline. There's a couple of different ways that you can do your headline. You can do it as you know kind of an attention grabbing statement, something to tell people who you are and who you help, mm. or it could just be like keywords. You know, you could just have like you know, business or, you know, accountant, business advisor, uh, tax specialist, you know, whatever, like he could have it like that. But in this case, it's Kelowna accountant and business advisor, keyword, keyword, helping businesses, startups, and real estate investors experience growth and profits. So he's basically got his keywords in there. He's telling who he helps and what he helps them do. So well, I noticed even with your profile and Ken's profile, uh, just when example, when I do pay per click, uh, I would capital capitalize the first letter of every word. Just looking at your profile and Ken's profile, with you, you capitalize the first letter. It almost makes your profiles stand out a little bit more compared to the rest. Yeah. Um, yes, and you know what? Very much so, especially within the profile. Mm -hmm. the one has only got 120 characters, so it's not. You know, as important, but within the actual summary and in the description of the profile, LinkedIn doesn't allow for formatting. So you can't bold, you can't italicize, you can't, add, right. you know, you can't add all these different formatting features. So there's ways of doing that with capitalization and adding some some uh, different characters, like you know, bullets and you know, different things. And I'll talk about that a little bit too, because yes, you know, that's a big part of the standing out part. Mm. So I'm glad you brought that up, Dan. The second place to po uh, post your keywords, and I just want to, I just want to um, uh, clarify here. When I say keywords, I don't mean you know have two keywords in your headline and then two different in your current work experience. It's about optimizing your profile for two or three specific keywords and having the exact same keywords in all the places that I'm talking about. So keep that in mind. It's not about switching them up. You need to be consistent. So you want to have them in your headline. You ha want to have them in your current work experience. Now, I'm sure uh, because Vancouver is a very entrepreneurial city, and I know that the Vancouver Entrepreneurial Group is very entrepreneurial, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs on the line. Yes. And most people will tend to write that they're owner or founder or something like that, or even CEO or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nobody is looking for an owner or a founder or a CEO unless they're one of the salespeople that I've trained. I see. <laughs> because I, I train see. salespeople on a regular basis on how to use LinkedIn for lead generation. And if they Okay, so so that's where I'm getting all these messages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. You are um you know, if you're a salesperson and you your ideal target audience is business owners, you're going to be using these keywords, uh, searches, owner, founder, you know, stuff like that. But your ideal clients are not. They're not looking for an owner or founder. If you are a web, if you own a website company, 
don't say you're the, the you're the owner and the founder. Say that you're a website developer and a website designer because that's what people are going to be looking for. Wow. You show up, right? So right there, it's a good tip. Right there. Yeah, that's really really powerful because almost every business owner does the same thing. They do this: owner, consultant, or founder, or whatever. Um, so you want to put those those terms, those keywords that you choose. Like I said, two or three in the title of your current position. And for additional SEO juice or, or LinkedIn search juice, put it in your description too. The next place is in your past work experience. So for some of you, this is going to be easy because you previously did what you're doing now. For others of you, you might be doing something brand new that you've never done before. And if that's the case, basically how LinkedIn kind of looks at this for their search al algorithm is they say, you know, if, if Dan was doing you know, what he's doing now in his last position, he's more relevant than somebody who's just doing this for the first time. So we're going to show Dan higher than the searchers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who this doesn't work for, here's a little ninja trick for you, okay? Um, you can create a project-based past experience. So let me give you an example. So I do a lot of different, you know, work for... I do work for business owners, for entrepreneurs. I also do work for, for larger companies who have sales teams. So I could put in there that I worked for, you know, XYZ company um, doing, you know, social selling training, for example. If let's say social selling training was my keyword. And I did that previously for this company. And it was, you know, over a two month period that I trained the company. And in my description, I'll say, you know, for, um, this company hired me for two months to come in and train their sales team on this and this and this. Now I have a past work experience, even though that's part of my current work experience. So that's just a little ninja trick for, for those of you who are actually starting in something new that you didn't do before. Got it. So it could be just a project. It doesn't have to be an, an actual job position or anything like that. Just yeah. work you've done in the past, project you've done in the past. You just want to have at least one past experience that's relative and related to what you do now. It'll just Makes be really helpful with the search results. Makes sense. Got it. Okay. The fourth place is in your summary section. So in your summary section, you want to make sure that you include those, those you know, again, two or three keywords. Uh, to get found. So here's what's great about LinkedIn is as you make these changes, I want before you make these changes, I want you to pay attention to these stats. You can find this on the home uh, on the home page of LinkedIn. So if you go into your LinkedIn profile and you click on home at the top left of the navigation bar, on the far right hand side you'll see who's viewed your profile, how many times your profile has been viewed in the past, you know, day, three days, seven days, 30 days, 90 days, depending on how active you are on LinkedIn, and how many times you showed up in the search results. When you make these changes, you will see those numbers exponentially increase over, like immediately and con continuously over time. So it's really interesting because, you know, how many times you're showing up in the search results is so completely relevant about how many times you're actually showing up based on the keywords that people are looking for. And then of that, how many people are actually going to click on your profile? So these are the kind of numbers that I see on a daily basis on my profile. And they range, like if I'm doing a webinar like this, those numbers will be higher. This is just like typically an average day. So pay attention to where you are right now before you make the changes that I'm suggesting and watch how these numbers actually increase. And the best part of all is that when you make the changes that I'm suggesting, the change, the results in the search ranking is instant. So anybody who knows anything about websites knows, Dan, how long does it take to get onto page one of Google? Uh, months, months. If, if ever for some businesses, right? Some businesses never can get there. Others it can take months, others it can take years and sometimes a lot of money. Correct. With LinkedIn, it happens instantly. So you can literally go from page 50 to page one or page five to page one or page 10 to page one. Mm. Who doesn't love instant gratification? Correct. Correct. <laughs> so basically because LinkedIn is an authority site, it's got high page rank. So when we make changes, bam, it shows up on Google. No, it doesn't just show up in Google. It shows up on LinkedIn. Like, oh, wow. Go, Perfect. Got it. You can go from page 50 of LinkedIn to page one of LinkedIn in an instant. 
So basically, we can test a lot of these. So let's say if I update my profile, I change the keywords, just kind of a little bit of testing, see how it does. And then maybe I can go back and change my title a little bit, change my description a little bit. I could do a little bit of testing with that and see what works. Yeah, absolutely. And here's the other thing too, you know, over time you might discover a new keyword that you want to get optimized for and you just go in and make a few little tiny tweaks to your LinkedIn profile and bang, you're showing up for a new keyword. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's very cool. Hmm. Okay, so let's get into step two, which is a really important step. This is attracting your ideal clients right within your LinkedIn profile because your profile needs to speak to them. And if it's a resume or if it's a professional bio, it's not going to speak to them. So let me give you some specific tips and strategies that you can do to make sure that you have a client-focused LinkedIn profile. The first thing you want to do is write in first person. So no more bar, boring bio or resume. You want, to, you want to speak to an individual. You want to write in first person. And I, I was recently on a, a social selling summit where there was a bunch of different speakers. And uh, I spoke on you know similar, a similar topic to what I'm speaking on tonight. And I told people this. And there was another speaker that spoke on it that said to people, no, 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 you should write in third person. And... Somebody had sent me an email afterwards and said, oh, yeah, Melanie, you know, when you were doing your webinar, like the chat room just blew up. I didn't see the chat room because I had pre-recorded it and I actually wasn't on live for the mm. summit. And I said, oh, yeah, so, you know, what happened? <laughs> because I was curious. What were people talking about? He's like, well, you know, somebody else had before you had said you should write in third person. So, for example, Melanie Dodero is a LinkedIn expert and blah, 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 where I say, you know, I, uh, I love to help business owners, entrepreneurs, and sales teams leverage LinkedIn, you know, for whatever. I speak to people, not about myself. Mm. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, you know, everybody in the chat room agreed with you. I see. And so this is where the, your, the copywriting skill comes into play. Well, you know what it is? Is people forget that although LinkedIn's a social, like although LinkedIn's a business social network, it's still a social network, and you want for to people. be social. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the guy, we actually ended up having a conversation with the guy that had shared information that was completely contradictory to me, and we wanted to find out, you know, what his opinion was on that. And it was really interesting because, and I'm so glad that this is just my Vancouver group tonight because I don't want him hearing about this, but he basically said, you know, it's important to rank for your name. And I'm like, I've never heard anything so crazy before. Why would you want to rank for your name? You already, your name is your name and your name's on your profile. And if somebody's looking for you, they're going to find you. You want to rank for the things that, for, for the keywords, for the people that don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, you know, by saying Melanie Dodero, so, you know, I'm going to rank higher for my name. I already rank at the top of the search results for my name. I guess if your name's John Smith, you know, you might have to do a little bit more work. But, you know, for the most part, that's not an issue. So you really want to write in first person. You want to be personable. Mm -hmm. The Makes second sense. thing that you want to do is you want to identify who your ideal clients are. So my goal, we write a lot of LinkedIn profiles for clients, and my goal is when I'm writing a profile uh, for a client, is that if their ideal client, if they send a connection request to their ideal client, or their ideal client is you know, doing a search on LinkedIn and comes across their profile, that when they land on that profile, that it speaks to them, that they see themselves in that profile, uh, and, and encourages them to actually take some kind of action. So what you want to do in addition to identifying them and speaking to them. So for example, if I deal with, you know, VPs of, of, of sales of, you know, fortune 500 companies, and I say, I deal with VPs of sales of fortune 500 companies. If one of those lands on my profile, they know that they're in the right place. But what you also want to do is share how you can help them. So you want to talk a little bit about what are they struggling with? What are the problems that they're facing and how do you help them? And, you know, there's that good old saying, you know, what's in it for me? You want to remember that because the reality of it is, is nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about me. They only care about how we can help them. And so if you make your profile all about you, it's not going to resonate with anybody. And the final part, and, and, and let me just backtrack for one quick second too, because 
I talked about the importance of the headline um, in the search rankings. And the other thing that's really important about the headline is it's going to determine whether somebody's going to click on your profile if you show up in the, in the search results. But once they land on your profile, the very first thing that they're going to look at is your summary section. So this is a very, very important part of your profile, uh, that it's written well, that it's client focused, and that you end with a call to action. So what happens is, you know, somebody lands on your profile and they're like, oh yeah, uh, this person could really, really help me with this problem that I have, you know, or I'm building a new website and I need a new website de designer or developer. Um, yeah, maybe I'll reach out to them tomorrow. Tomorrow comes along, they forget. Next week comes along, they're like, gosh, who is that person that I found on LinkedIn that I wanted to reach out to? They don't remember their name anymore, they don't remember anything, and now they're lost. If you give them a specific call to action and tell them what to do, many will take advantage of that or, or take that direction right away. So this is as simple as, you know, if you're looking for help with X, X, Y, or Z, uh, you know, send me an email at this and, you know, I'd be happy to offer you a, a complimentary, you know, strategy session or consultation or audit or assessment or whatever it is you do and just tell them what to do, or, or phone me at this phone number, or if you want them to go to a web page and download something, you know, for, to learn more about this, uh, you know, download this free report, or attend this webinar, or whatever it is you want people to do, just tell them succinctly in one sentence at the end of your summary section. How so Melanie, let me, let me see if I get this correctly. So it's perfectly okay that for them to, to drive them uh, take them off LinkedIn and go to our website, opt in or watch this or, or, or get this report or whatever the call to action might be. It doesn't always have to be, uh, well, contact me through the LinkedIn, you know, inbox and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be like that at all. No, it doesn't have to be like that. And, and realistically, it this is going to vary for everybody. So I don't have a specific, um, you know, suggestion for each person. You have to look at your business model. How do you sell? For example, I, you know, if somebody's interested in my services, one of two things happen. They inquire about my services and we get on a phone call or, you know, they attend one of my webinars or they download one of my, uh, you know, download something and they find out about an online course that I'm offering and then they buy it. You know, so, so, you know, what are you looking for? What are you looking to achieve? Do you have a low priced a uh, ticket product that, you know, you're not going to get on the phone with people, but you've got some kind of a sales funnel that you want to put them into, like a, you know, a webinar or a free report or something like that. Or do you want to get on the phone with them? You know, what is your sales model? How are you selling? What, you know, it, it also depends on very much on the price point of what you're offering. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to get on the phone with somebody who who's interested in purchasing, you know, my $20 book. I can't. Mm -hmm. If I did, I'd, I'd never be off the phone, right? Sure. Um, but if somebody's going to purchase, you know, a service from me for, you know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, they're not going to do that without having a phone call with me. That's the only way that that's going to happen. Correct. So, you know, so it, it really is very dependent upon what is the model, what are you trying to achieve on LinkedIn, what are you trying to achieve in your business, and what is the model that you have that you follow, and how do you how do you sell people? And you know, people make the mistake a lot of times of thinking that they can do too much online, and I'm a big believer. Of, you know, uh, you know, taking business offline because I truly believe that you know you can't sell somebody online unless it's a very low ticket product. I totally agree, yeah. and it's it's all about multimedia marketing. You can generate a lead online, take them offline, or sometimes you you meet someone offline, and you put them into an online kind of funnel and have the online do the work and and follow up with them. Could be autoresponders, automated email, that type of thing. Yeah, so I'm, absolutely. You know, and Dan, you know, well, you are actually a really great example of that because I know that you're, you know, you're very much involved in like e-commerce sites and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And probably a lot of the e-commerce sites uh, are very low ticket items, right? They're not, you know, five thousand, ten thousand dollars. They're correct, a hundred or less or whatever, right? And you don't need to have a conversation with those people. But having said that, you do want to get them into a funnel because if you capture their name and their email address, you can continuously sell to them over and over and over again. Yes, so, so I totally agree. Absolutely on the same page. Cool. Okay. So the 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 Number one thing I want you to remember about this step two, about attracting your ideal clients, is if you make it about you, it's not about that, right? So just remember it's not about you because they don't care about you. So you want to speak to your ideal client. 
make us, you know, your profile, your profile needs to position you as a credible authority on your topic. It needs to share a little bit about why you do what you do. And that's important, but you want to just do a little bit of that and then dive right into who is your ideal client? What is their problem? And how do you help them? Again, your LinkedIn profile must be client focused. And the only way for you to be able to do that is to know your target market. If you don't understand what their problems are, if you don't understand the language that they use, this is going to be really challenging for you. And you're going to have to do a little bit of digging to, to really uncover this. One of the easiest ways to do that is to look at the last 10 clients that have been your, you know, your best clients, the ones that you really enjoyed working with, the ones that you helped the most ones that you know you transformed their life or their business or whatever it is the most who were they what did they look like what did they have in common were they in similar industries similar dem demographics uh geography you know what what was similar about them what kind of problems did they discuss and then you can start to dial in what positions do they hold um and then you can start to really dial in to get to know who they are better to really speak to them within your profile step three is to stand out and again I mentioned at the start, this is the easiest of all. The first thing you have to do to stand out is complete your profile. You're going to see as you use LinkedIn more and more, and I know everybody that attends my webinars uses LinkedIn more and more because they start to understand the true value of it. You're going to see how many people are using this so poorly, how many people have the crappiest profiles with like next to nothing in them, they're practically blank. Some of them are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Some and of some of them with no photos. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you know what happens when you have no photo? People think it's a fake profile. They don't trust it. Correct. So um, you want to complete your profile. Thank you for bringing up that. The photo is really important because people want to know that they're dealing with a person. If there's just a name and no picture attached to it or the picture looks fake or it's a stock image or it's a logo – not going to try. It, it's interesting. One of the biggest questions, and I know that this question is going to come up uh, when we have some time for questions, is, Melanie, you know, I'm trying to get more leverage on my, uh, my company page on LinkedIn. I get this asked every time I speak. And I'm like, forget about your company page. I'm not saying don't have a company page. Have a company page. I'm not saying don't post content on it. Post content on it. Don't rely on it for anything. People want to deal with people not logos and that I totally agree and at the end of the day I always say people buy people exactly so yeah. you know, that's where so when they see a smiling face you know connecting with them a close-up headshot where they can actually see the person it's important I see so many people with you know uh stock images or pictures of their pets or you know, <laughs> they think it's Facebook or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so funny. I did a seminar uh, a while back and there was this guy who had this uh, picture on his LinkedIn profile where he caught this big fish. It was like, I don't know, two or three feet long. And he was holding it so proudly displaying this fish that he caught. And uh, he, I pulled up his profile in the seminar and uh uh, you know, was giving feedback. And I'm like, okay, this picture, fine for Facebook, not for LinkedIn. <laughs> you know? Unless unless it's optimizing for fishmen or something yeah. like that. That's a different story. Even still, people can't see your face and they want My to goodness. they're connecting with, right? So, uh, yeah, this is really important. So have a nice, clean headshot, clean background, show your smiling face, uh, let them see your eyes and let them know that they're connecting with a real person. And here's the other thing. I talked about video and how difficult video used to be on LinkedIn. It's so easy now. You literally, if you have a video on YouTube or on any other, uh, any other you know, URL that you can just drop in, you drop it in, bang, the, the, the video is on your profile. Few how many videos can we upload? Like oh, one, two? Upload, no, you can upload tons, but I recommend no more than two. Okay. Uh, no more than two in each section. So you've got, you know, you can put videos in your summary section. You can put videos in your experience section. I've seen people that have uploaded like 50 different things under their summary. Nobody's going to look at them because they're overwhelmed. They're like, which one should I watch? I see. So no more than two. Um, and basically you want, the reason you want to add videos is twofold. One, it visually enhances your profile. They see this image and, you know, LinkedIn, a LinkedIn profile is kind of boring and blah, right? It's all text. 
So it adds that, that image uh, in there. Second thing is video allows people to get to know you more, right? They're hearing your voice, they're seeing you, uh, they're getting a feel for your style and who you are, and it's just opening up that to a more, you know, a more human uh, kind of interaction. And it's almost like when you take the time to make a professional video, not just it makes you stand out, it just makes you you're more like a professional. Like, like, like for your, for in this case, your video, um, you're looking for a social media speaker, well, I want to see you in action if I'm an event planner. And now you've answered the question that I, oh, I wonder, uh, how's her speaking skill? Is it good? Is it, is it a good fit for my event? And bam, I watch a two-minute video, okay, this looks, this looks good. I should get in touch with you. Yeah. So makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing that you can add to your profile, both for optimization purposes and for a visual component, is the skills section. And this is a very heavily debated section because people are like, you know, what are endorsements? Like they're, you know, one click and I, I get people endorsing me all the time and I don't even know who they are and I hear this stuff all the time. And I agree. A one click endorsement doesn't mean much. But here's the thing, when you go to somebody's profile and you see that all these different people have endorsed them and you see all those little pictures, there's an element of social proof that is subconscious. It's not even conscious. It's not like, oh, well, you know, they must be good because they, you know, it, it's just a subconscious, wow, look how many people have endorsed them, you know. But here's the interesting thing about this that nobody knows or very few people know. If they, there was two profiles that were identical, let's say me and somebody else, my uh, social media marketing term that I've got in my skills sections got, I don't know, somewhere around 1,200, 1,400, 1,500 endorsements on that one specific word. If somebody else had copied my profile verbatim, which I've had that happen before where people copied my profile or copied my blog posts and stuff like that. <laughs> Well, it, it, is, it is a form of compliment, I guess. Yeah. This is so good. <laughs> but they shouldn't do that. No, they shouldn't. But if they copied it verbatim and uh, everything was identical and I had a thousand people promote, you know, endorse me for the term social media marketing and that other person had a hundred, I would show up higher mm. in the search results. So. Remember I said that there's four places to put your keywords? Here's the bonus fifth. Make sure you put your keywords in your skills section. So those two or three primary keywords that you can choose, plus a whole bunch of secondary ones. So now you can start to talk about all the different things you do. If you're a website company, you do branding. Put branding in here. If you do social media marketing, put social media marketing in here. If you do graphic design, put graphic design in here. This is where you can just like literally put in all the different things that you you do and that are, are your skills. And as more and more people endorse you for them, you're up leveling your social proof and your search ranking. Now, social proof is definitely much more powerful when somebody's actually taken the time taken the time to write you a recommendation. You know, this is some you know somebody's uh, actually sent something, thought about it, written it up, sent it to you. That's that's a much higher level of social proof, and that's where I understand the debate comes from. From you know the one click endorsement to the actual recommendation. So when you look, and here's the here's the thing that. Um, has been studied in, in psychology and the psychology of, of sales and buying. And that's that if people are thinking about doing business with somebody, they think about, they make decisions based on the decisions that other people have made. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. I shared my story earlier about when my family was all on Facebook. And the funny story about that, by the way, my mom was on Facebook before me. Mm. Uh, and it was because my family was all on it, and then I started to see some friends get on it that I got onto Facebook. And I would imagine that it's probably the same for each and every single person here on the line today. We all got on social media because we either saw our friends, our family, our peers, our colleagues, or our competitors on it. And we decided, oh gosh, I need to be there too. At mm -hmm. Amazon years ago, and Daniel loved this because you're an e-commerce guy. Mm -hmm. Amazon years ago discovered that, gosh, people aren't buying our products based on our marketing copy 
or the manufacturers, uh, you know, write up about it. They're buying it based on the customer reviews. Mm. Customer reviews are what's selling product on Amazon. So social proof is just such an important element of everything that you do in social media, especially on LinkedIn, because you can get those endorsements and you can get those recommendations. I'm going to give you one last and final example of social proof, and this is one that we can all relate to. So imagine that you're, you know, in a different city, maybe you're in a different city for business or, or for pleasure, and you're walking down the street and you're trying to figure out where to go for dinner. You're like, you know, I'm kind of craving Italian. Maybe, you know, let's find an Italian restaurant. You walk by this little Italian restaurant, you know, it looks nice. You peek through the window and you see one table of two. And you're like, oh, gosh, this can't be a very good restaurant. And then down the street, you see a restaurant with a lineup. You're like, oh, yeah, let's go there. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the reality of it. That restaurant with a table for two, a table of two, and then the rest of the restaurant was vacant might have this wonderful Italian woman in the kitchen making the most beautiful homemade Italian food, authentic, uh, you know, cooked with love, all that stuff, but nobody knows they're there because they haven't marketed themselves. And then you've got the other restaurant down the street that's more of a pub and it's pub food and it's nothing special, but everybody knows they're there and there's a lineup in front. That's got to be the place to go. Right. And so people gravitate to that. So social proof is really, really important again, because when people are in doubt of what decision to make, they look at the decision that others have made and that's where the recommendations come in. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I, I've got a few more tips I want to share with you and then I'm going to recap some of the stuff and we'll save a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to share with you guys a few of the, the tips and this, the principles that I, I wrote about in my book, the LinkedIn code. So basically if you want to track more business on LinkedIn, it's important to follow these very simple principles. The first one is listen. You want to listen to the language that your ideal clients use to describe their challenges and their problems. This is the language that you want to use both in your profile and any messages that you send out. Next, you want to invest. And when I say invest, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about time. Invest the time to complete your LinkedIn profile. Don't be lazy with this. This is your personal brand. It's often your first online impression. Make sure you take the time to have a fully completed LinkedIn profile as well as an optimized profile to really set you apart from you know, competitors and other people in your industry. The next one's means. You really need to, um, your profile really needs to express the needs of your ideal client, especially your headline and your summary section. And again, I'm going to reiterate the importance of client focus. You need to speak to those clients. Keywords. Make sure you've used your keywords throughout your profile so that you're showing up at the top of the search results. Every single time you're not showing up on page one of LinkedIn search uh, for what you offer, it's a lost opportunity. LinkedIn you can control. Google you can't. Google's going to take you months Maybe you need to hire an SEO person to do that, and maybe it's going to take you, you know, months or a year. But with LinkedIn, you could do it overnight. So take the time, figure out those keywords, and optimize your profile. You want to enhance your profile. You want to visually enhance your profile. You want to add multimedia to it, videos, slideshow presentations, PDF documents. In addition to adding a human element to your profile, it adds a visual component to your profile. You want to develop, and this is one of the things I talk about in depth in my LinkedIn, uh, in, the, in my book, The LinkedIn Code, you want to develop a LinkedIn lead generation campaign. I'm really big on, you know, LinkedIn, you know, so many people will come up to me at, at events where I speak at and they're like, you know, Melanie, I've been using LinkedIn for four years and I haven't gotten any business from it. It's like, oh, well, that's because you've just been waiting around for business to come to you. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, business can find you on LinkedIn if you optimize your profile, but don't rely on that. You want to be proactive in your approach to LinkedIn. You want to generate 
and develop a LinkedIn lead generation campaign that you're going to follow daily, you know, checklist of the different activities you're going to do daily and weekly, relationship building messages that you can use and put on autopilot. This is one of the things I talk about in my book and one of the services that we, we do in uh, when we're working with a client to help them with a campaign is we'll create a series of messages that they can use to send out once somebody's actually connected with them. Hmm. The next thing you want to do is initiate new relationships and dialogues. And you will need to do this by personalizing all of your messages, your replies, and your connection requests. The big thing, the big mistake I see people make with social media is they're lazy. And I don't teach shortcuts. I teach lots of time-saving things that people can do. But I never teach shortcuts when it comes to relationship building because if you don't, if you don't include their name in the message, it looks like a autoresponder or it looks like a, you know, a, a spam message, right? So it's about personalizing things and, and that's really, really important if somebody's going to actually read it. You also want to nurture. You want to take the time to nurture your relationships on LinkedIn. And how we do this is by creating a series of value-based messages that you can send to new connections. So I, again, that's all in my book. I outline how that works. Um, it's really important that you know once you connect with somebody that you're not trying to sales pitch them right away. Nobody likes that. You want to nurture that relationship. You know, build a relationship. Provide some value before you even ask to have a conversation with them. Develop your credibility, position your value, you know, give them value, give them value for free. And then, you know, and then you can kind of take it to the next level. The next thing is connect. You want to make an effort to regularly build your network and connect with new prospects and even strategic partners. There's a lot of businesses that I work with or uh, professionals that I work with. I, I mentioned financial advisors earlier, but there, that's, that's a perfect example of, you know, uh, a, a profession where people aren't going on LinkedIn to search for. That's where they're asking their friends and their family, like, do you know a financial advisor? Cause I've got, I want to invest and I'm not happy with mine or I haven't had one before. And, and it's something that's very much based on trust. So how a financial advisor could use LinkedIn much more effectively, obviously they could still connect with people and they could build a relationship with people. But one of the things that they could do very effectively is to develop some strategic partners or strategic alliances. So connect with the accountants and the lawyers and all the other people that have the same target audience as you, that you could develop a, a strategic alliance with them, refer business back and forth to. Because here's what's really important to know, is your ability to find prospects on LinkedIn or be found when somebody's searching for what you offer is limited to the size of your network. So if your network is really small and you've only got, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 people in it, only your first, second and third level network or members of the same group can actually find you or you can find them. So the larger your network is and the more people you connect with, the better you are uh, in, in terms of being able to find the people that you want to find and getting found. So connecting with people with large networks can be very, very beneficial for you. Um, but you also want to be, you know, selective. Like for example, I've got a huge network, um, but I don't connect with, you know, what's called lions, LinkedIn open network people. Whenever I get a message from somebody that's got lion in their name or their headline, I, I delete it. I ignore it. I don't accept it because I know that they're a person that connects with anybody and everybody, and they probably have a very low quality network. So it's not just about quality. It's, I mean, it's not just about quantity. It's very much about quality. Here's something that's really important, and this is a mistake that everybody makes in social media in general. <clears throat> they keep everything online. Dan and I met, mentioned earlier when we were talking about, you know, you know, different price points that you're selling at. If you're selling a $20 book or a $200 course or a $300 course, yeah, it can be online. But if you're selling a $2,000, $3,000, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 package of some sort, you need to have that conversation offline. So you want to move your relationships to the next level with your connections. Uh, and the only way to do that is offline because that's where you convert a prospect to a client. Now you want to dedicate uh, a certain amount of time to LinkedIn every day. And I'm going to say, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes depends on what your goal is. The more time you spend on it, the more of an increase you're going to see in leads, prospects, and clients. 
So you have to decide, are you at a point in your business where, you know, you're just kind of treading and you don't really need that much more business. You're going to spend 10 or 15 minutes. If you're in, you know, uh, you know, startup mode, you want to spend an hour or so. If you're in kind of momentum, but I still want to grow mode, you might spend 30 minutes. You need to figure out what works for you, but be consistent. And the last one is etiquette. You want to make sure that you're following good etiquette and best practices. And I'll just share one quick tip on this. Please don't ever, ever send another connection request to anybody ever again without personalizing it. Unless it's your best friend, your business partner, or somebody you know really, really well. If it's anybody else, make sure you personalize that connection request because I'm at the point where I'm close to the limit of the amount of people that I can accept on LinkedIn and I don't accept connection requests uh, for the most part, unless they're personalized. And even if that person doesn't have a picture in their profile, which is usually automatically not accepted, but they personalized a note to me, I know they're a real person, I accept it. So um, that's really, really important. That's just one of the many you know, rules of etiquette and best practices that you should follow. So if you missed any of these... Um, I, love the, I, love the, I love the acronym as well, it's perfect. Yeah, if you missed any of these uh, items that I just talked about, you can download the cheat sheet with all the things I just mentioned. You can go to licodecheatsheet.com. I know Dave uh, posted that on uh, the Facebook group, so some of you guys might already have that, but for those of you that don't, you can download that and have that as a resource to have by your desk as you're kind of working through LinkedIn. I'm going to do a real quick recap on the things that we talked about, so if you missed anything in your notes, you'll have them, because I know I see some of the questions that people ask me to repeat certain things. Uh, if you're optimizing your profile, so to get found, you want to put your keywords in your headline, current work experience, past work experience, and summary. I also mentioned the fifth place to add that as a bonus is your skills section. If you want to attract your ideal clients within your profile, write in first person, identify who they are, share how you can help them, make sure you have a call to action, let them know what to do next. If you want to stand out, have a professional picture, you know, a nice headshot, fill out your profile in its entirety, add a video or other multimedia, add skills to get endorsed and also recommendations. If anybody wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, you're more than welcome to. I just ask that you send me a personal uh, connection request note and just an FYI, sometimes with mobile apps and some of the apps, uh, when you when you try to do it, it doesn't personalize it. It doesn't even give you the option. It just sends it. So a lot of times when I do speaking events, uh, people will send me one by mistake through their mobile phone, and they'll like it'll just go off, and then they'll like be horrified because I said specifically, please personalize it, and then they'll send me another one, a second one from their computer, and say, I'm so sorry, you didn't give me the option. Uh, so. Be cautious about sending things from mobile apps. Uh, it used to be available. Apparently, it's available now. I don't use mobile apps for LinkedIn because of all the restrictions that used to be in place. Apparently, they've improved it, but I've just gotten in the habit of using it on my computer. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you're more than welcome to. Uh, I'll absolutely accept your connection request if it's personalized. And I want to leave you with this final thought. And this is something that um, you know most people do wrong. Don't just collect connections. Build relationships. If you're sending a connection request to somebody or you're accepting somebody, uh, one from somebody and there's never any follow-up, there's never any dialogue, nothing's going to happen. And the other part of that is going, we're in just such an interesting point in, in, in the world where, you know, we've just had this, you know, such a big change in, in how we do business and how we, you know, just everything. And I think that, you know, the, the, just the amount of online stuff that's available has really, really affected the a way that people actually relate. And so, you know, doing things offline and, and building those relationships are so important because your network and whether it's online or offline, going forward is going to equal, be very, very equal to your network. So um, I know I went a little bit longer than I, I normally do here. I actually went, I've gone four minutes over the whole allocated time that we had for today, but I'm happy to stay on the line for another five minutes or so, if that's okay with you, Dan, and just 
Yeah, absolutely, and I appreciate it. And actually, I have some questions as I'm, I'm listening as well. So some of them might be very short. You just say yes, no, or, or you can you can elaborate on those as well. So uh, in here, uh, quick question: uh, basic account or premium account? Okay, great question. It's a question that gets asked every single time. Um, the answer to the answer I have to every single question is it depends. I can't answer that question because I don't know who the person is or who their target audience is or what they're trying to achieve. But here's what I can tell you. A, pre, a free account works for most people. Here's who I recommend a premium account to. Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of work with sales teams. And so if you're uh, you know, a, a, an individual, an entrepreneur, business owner, or salesperson that is going after a very specific market, like let's say for example, it's you know, Fortune 1000 companies and you want to only connect with you know senior level employees and you want to find companies that have you know a thousand or more employees or you want this or you want that right you have very specific uh, requirements in what you're looking for a premium counts perfect because it gives you a whole bunch of additional search filters advanced search filters that aren't available in a free account so if you've got some of those things that that you're looking for in the prospects that you're looking to seek out on LinkedIn, then a premium account makes sense. If you don't, perfect. then you'll never need a premium account. Now here's one of the, the things that people like a premium account for. They like to see all the people who have viewed their profile. Now for most people, not more than five people view the profile a day. So it's not an issue, but if you've got, you know, 40 people or 50 people or 60 people or 70 people viewing your profile a day, uh, you know, some people like to just see who that is. Um, I have a premium account. Uh, I've got, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 people viewing my profile a day. I never look at who they are because it's just, I'm just inundated with it. Great. Uh, how do you get more recommendations? You ask for them, but don't ever ask for them from people that you don't know. Don't ever ask for them that, from people that can't truly really vouch for you. I get requests on a daily basis of people saying, hey, Melanie, can you recommend me? And I'm like, I don't even know who you are. Now, <clears throat> um, yeah, you just ask for them, but make it really easy for people. You know, tell them why you're asking for recommendations. So, for example, when you give people a reason why to connect with you, when you're sending a connection request and you're saying, hey, you know, I noticed that we're both in the Vancouver area and we're entrepreneurs and I love connecting with like-minded people and was really hoping that you'd accept my connection request on LinkedIn, that's going to get you accepted nine times out of ten versus the one time out of ten when you're just sending a random uh, default message. Same thing with a, a connection uh, or a, a recommendation request. If you want to get a recommendation, tell people why you want one. You can say something as simple as, you know, I attended this LinkedIn webinar last night and learned of the importance of, you know, having a good profile and getting some recommendations. So I've been working hard on improving my profile and I was really hoping that you can give me a recommendation. And you could even give them a couple of like little bullet points or ideas of what they could say because a lot of times they don't know what to say. They might love you and want to give you a recommendation, but they don't know what to say. So the easier you make it for somebody, the more recommendations you'll get. Great, great answer. One last question. Uh, is it worthwhile to post more often? Because I could see the options we can post articles or it's almost like a mini blog uh, within LinkedIn. Is it worthwhile doing that? Yeah, so there's two ways to post on LinkedIn. One is a status update and you can do that you know, on a daily basis, mm -hmm. once a day. And then the other is through LinkedIn Publisher and that's where you post literally a blog post. And that's mm -hmm. fairly new. Uh, it's been around for a while, but it was only available to influencers, and now it's available to everybody. The advantage to doing that is that every single one of your connections gets a notification every single time you post a blog. Um, the downside of that is that every single one of your, your connections gets a notification for every single one of their connections. So I, I what I do, because I've got 25,000 connections, Every single time I get notifications mm -hmm. for people adding new uh, blog posts like LinkedIn through LinkedIn Publisher, I start unsubscribing yeah. to them because I'm like, I don't even know who these people are and I don't want to see their stuff and anybody that I know and respect and, and like I keep. <clears throat> so um, in the beginning, this used to be wildly effective because people were like, you know, not very many people are doing it. Now, the more and more people are doing it, it, it's going to become less and less relevant, but it's still a great idea to do because you can get a whole new audience uh, that you don't get on your own website or your blog. 
Uh, you can stay top of mind within your own network. And, uh, and if you've grown your network properly or grow it properly going forward, um, those prospects that you have have potential of seeing that. So absolutely do it. I recommend, you know, once a week or once every two weeks. And here's the great thing. You can repurpose content. So, you know, you can take a co content from your blog that you posted two or three weeks ago and then repurpose it on LinkedIn. So you don't have to create special content just for LinkedIn. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie. Again, www.licodecheatsheet.com and make sure you read uh, Melanie's book. It's a fantastic book and she goes out into a lot more detail because I read the book as well and you can see different samples as well. Uh, of course, take action, implement the strategies, uh, connect uh, with Melanie. And again, Melanie, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dan. I'm looking forward to coming back to Vancouver and coming to your amazing uh, Vancouver Entrepreneurs Group soon. All right. Bye for now. Okay. Thank you. Have a great night.